You've heard now our first three speakers make numerous references to the lower basin's drought contingency plan. We've talked now a little bit about the upper basin's drought contingency planning. Um, and frankly, the lower basin is, has a much more aggressive drought contingency plan. We've made reference to it, and it's important that you hear directly from the lower basin. Colby Pellegrino has joined us from the Las Vegas Valley Water District, the, the district that serves the greater Las Vegas area and draws water directly from Lake Mead. Um, Colby, thank you for joining us from Las Vegas and uh, look forward to your comments. Thank you, everyone. I'm uh, no replacement for my boss, John Ensminger, who was supposed to be here today, and he apologizes. He would love to have been up here today um, to talk with you all, but I'm here instead. Unlike him, I am not a native of the state of Colorado, but I am a native of uh, Las Vegas. I grew up uh, with a very close relationship to the river in a much different way. We had a boat on Lake Mead for many years. Um, and when I was born, there were less than 30,000 people living in our cozy town of 2.6 million today. Um, so I've seen our city grow and change throughout time um, in, a, in a strikingly different way than you all have seen the river grow and change throughout time. So without wasting any more time on introduction, I'm going to dive right in. I hope to leave some time at questions for the end, time at the end for questions. <laughs> so. Um, I'll go through some of this quickly. As um, Chris said, Southern Nevada Water Authority supplies seven out of every 10 homes, um, every seven out of every 10 Nevadans um, in the southernmost county, known as Clark County. Um, Southern Nevada is also nearly entirely reliant on the Colorado River. Um, it makes up over 90% of our supplies um, for that community. Um, and that community has zero agriculture in it. Um, it is um, wholly municipal uses of Colorado River water. So, and the next couple of slides are how, uh, what's happening on the Colorado River. And um, I grew up in this basin as a hydrologist and began working on Colorado River modeling over a decade ago, so I would be remiss to give a presentation without a graph of probabilities. Um, this graph is actually incorrectly labeled. Um, this is historical and future projections for Lake Powell, not Lake Mead. Um, and you can see that by the elevations on the left-hand side that are in the 3,700 to 3,400 acre foot range. Um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here. It's hard to see the details of this chart up on those uh, projectors, but the dark blue is where 80% of various hydrological futures get us. If you just look at the past, 80% of those fall in that dark blue range. Um, and when you look out to 2026, the end of the time frame here, the dotted line that runs horizontal about a third of the way up from the bottom is the minimum power pool elevation in Lake Powell. And you see that for the major those 80% of the traces, we don't get below that minimum power pool. But the lighter shaded blue area is the 10%. And um, that should be a big concern to everyone, that that, that lower 10%, if that's what the future looks like, um, we're going to see the sand at the bottom of Lake Powell in places we don't want to see the sand at the bottom of Lake Powell. Um, we're going to drop below minimum power pool in Lake Powell, and there's a whole host of consequences associated with that that um, I am not the right person to talk to this group about. But the dark blue line there, um, just to note, this, this basin has operated for a long time um, on probabilities. Um, and probabilities are always wrong. They're useful, but they're always wrong. Um, so, so what that dark blue line is, is a, what they call a plausible future elevation. I have to say this graph was prepared by the Bureau of Reclamation. It was not prepared by us. And this is what Lake Powell's elevation looks like if the drought from 2001 to 2008 repeats itself between now and 2026. So um, if you don't relate to probabilities well, we can relate really well to history repeating itself. 
This next slide is um, that same manifestation as things roll through the current guidelines and project Lake Mead into the future. Again, that blue area, darker blue area being where 80% of the hydrology puts us and the lower blue area being the lowest 10%. And you can see there that our story is a little worse. The dark blue area, over half of our futures show us going into shortage and staying in shortage through 2026. Um, and there's a big collection of hydrology that shows us blowing through all three of our shortage levels and being in a position where we have to renegotiate the guidelines. Um, the current guidelines call that if we drop below 1025 and we're projected to fall further, that we will reconsult the guidelines. So I'm going to leave that now and for a moment go back to what we've been doing. So the, the way this works is I'm going to talk a little bit about Southern Nevada's planning that's led up to the hydrology we've been seeing on the Colorado River um, and the things we've been doing to react to that. And then I'm going to close out with a little more discussion of the DCP. So we have a four-legged stool um, in Southern Nevada. Everyone should have a stool for their planning. It should always have at least three legs or you're going to fall. Um, ours has four, sometimes five, um, and those things are banking resources, doing resource planning, and, and what should be included in resource plan is helping shape policy, um, conservation, and infrastructure. I don't have any other slides on resource plan, but I am going to tell you that resource planning has been invaluable for getting our community to respond. We take a 50-year projection of our resources to our board of directors every single year that looks at different hydrology scenarios, it looks at different demand and growth scenarios, and it looks at our water resource options. Um, and that's so that our board and the community every year has to be reminded that we are the driest city in the driest state in the nation. Um, and we can't, we can't be there if we don't plan prudently for our water supply. But the other thing that it helps remind our community is that we don't have the luxury of making decisions now um, and only looking 10 years ahead. If we're going to be a successful city for the next 50 years, we have to start thinking about things um, long into the future. And reminding people of that consistent look long into the future is important as we make really tough decisions today. So this is just a water banking snapshot. What's on the lower left bar chart is our current Colorado River consumptive use, 243,000 acre feet. And what's on the right is the volume of water that we've banked in our various storage accounts. And we've accumulated enough water to supply our community for eight years on that supply alone. Now, obviously, we can't take that supply um, all in one year, uh, but we have accumulated a serious amount of water to help us bridge um, to future resources. The next thing we've done is conservation. And uh, our conservation program is a four-legged stool as well um, that involves regulations, incentive programs, pricing, and education. We can go into a lot of detail about this, but it's not really um, germane to the conversation about DCP, so I'm going to skip over it, but tell you that our turf removal program, um, which is one of the most successful in the nation, we used to say we were the largest in the nation until Metropolitan Water District spent more in one year than we had spent since 2002. Um, I guess that's the luxury you have when you have 22 million people you supply, not 2 million. Uh, but our, our strip of sod that we've removed wraps 94% of the way around the earth as we sit here today, and we've just increased our rebates um, to continue to um, emphasize the need for our community to adapt long term to drought. And the result of that is shown here. Um, since 2002, uh, which is when, uh, as many of you recall, one of the driest years on record in the Colorado River, very early in the onset of the current drought, since that time, our population has gone up 41%. Our per capita water use has come down 38%. And our Colorado River consumptive use has decreased 28%. 
and to add to that, this is just a chart of our Colorado River use. You can see that peak there in 2002 of 325,000. And now as we sit at the end of the planning horizon here, we're below 250,000. We do see this inching back up as our economy inches back up. Um, and as we mentioned, we're doubling down on conservation right now. And our conservation program is not limited just to incentives. Um, there's carrots and sticks. There's um, voluntary incentive programs and there's code. New development cannot put turf in commercial um, properties at all. Um, new homes cannot have turf in their front yard. They can only have turf in half of their backyard. Um, so we make sure that we hit our conservation messaging on um, every platform that we can. The next way that we've adapted is our third intake. Um, this is a tunnel that goes underneath Lake Mead. We are the only large Colorado River water user that takes our water directly out of Lake Mead. Um, and as Lake Mead began to decline, that created an infrastructure issue. It also created a water quality issue. So we built a two and a half mile tunnel all the way beneath Lake Mead to the historic Thalweg of the river where our modeling showed the best water quality we could receive long term. That is at elevation 860 feet and it cost us $817 million. To go with that, we had to construct a new pump station. And this graph just shows number one and two are our existing pump stations. And if Lake Mead were to fall below elevation 1,000 feet today, we would not be able to pump water into the Las Vegas Valley despite having our third intake in place. So we have begun constructing a third intake pump station that will allow us to deliver water down to elevation 875. That may not be significant to many folks in this room, but that's 15 feet below dead pool elevation in Lake Mead. So when Lake Mead cannot make releases to meet the demands of California, Arizona, and the country of Mexico, we will still have water sitting on top of our pumps. And that cost us $650 million. Over $1.4 billion have been invested on these infrastructure projects alone, and there is zero federal dollars that have been applied here. All of this has come from our local ratepayers. We have not gotten any state funding, any federal funding, or any help from anyone else on the river to do this. And I think that's important to note, um, perhaps within this room, but within the lower basin in general, um, that we have to be willing to spend the money um, to make the tough decisions we need to make. So I, I put the thinker on the edge of Lake Mead here to ask us, isn't that enough? $1.4 billion, eight years of our annual supply stored, um, a 50-year resource plan that says if there's no drought on the Colorado River, we don't ever need a new water resource in the next 50 years. Um, Perhaps that's enough for Nevada, but it's not enough for the entire lower basin. Um, and that's where we get into the drought contingency planning framework. This is the current policy framework. And these are just the shortages that Nevada takes. And as you can see, we step down as the elevation of the lake steps down. And those reductions in our allocation put us at an allocation that is still higher than the amount of water we're taking off of the river today. So we're very well situated to deal with shortages. We're also incredibly well situated to deal with the reductions in DCP. But there's broader issues at work in the lower basin. The Bureau of Reclamation projects that there is a 35% chance Lake Mead will fall below elevation 1000 in 2026. At elevation 1,000, Lake Mead's holding capacity is 17%. Our community only has one operable intake. There is a limited ability to meet demands in Arizona, California, and Mexico. And I say that not because of a shortage or a policy framework that would short them, because physically, there's no water in Lake Mead. And because of the guidelines that we operate under now, when Lake Mead gets that low, there's not a lot of water left in Lake Powell either. Um, and Hoover Dam's ability to generate power is significantly reduced, if not completely crippled. So here's just a few more statistics on that. If Lake Mead reaches elevation 1,000, 
Um, and there is less than 4.5 million acre feet of water in storage to meet um, 8.7 million acre feet in downstream demands. And without proactive um, action, such as a DCP, if we tried to stop the elevation from going down in a single year, those reductions could mean a reduction in use of two to six million acre feet in a single year. So there's a lot of things riding on us being proactive about dealing with this instead of reactive. And sitting here, it's very easy to say what has to be done. Water management is not rocket science. Um, it's not brain surgery. We know <laughs> what levers can be used. Um, we know how they can be used. And it's very easy to see what needs to be done. The lower basin needs to reduce its use if it wants to control its own destiny. The hard thing to do is to figure out who has to suffer the pain of that. And that's where the current drought contingency plan um, is running into the most issues. There are some issues with California. I think California is very well situated to handle those issues. Um, but Arizona has, still has significant issues to overcome um, because they're taking a serious amount of cuts. Um, and that means significant loss, economic loss and otherwise for folks within their state and that's very hard to deal with. So the drought response that we've been making, um, you all have heard about system conservation, you've heard about drought contingency planning and again these are incentivized and voluntary um, just like we're hearing um, is what the hope of the upper basin plan is. And this is my we know this thing works slide. This is Lake Mead's elevation today. If you just look at that very top black line, that's the fall of Lake Mead's elevation since 2011. If you look at all of the colored lines underneath it, those are the voluntary programs that are in place as a result of either the 2007 interim guidelines or the system conservation agreement, um, or our agreements with Mexico. And if those agreements were not in place today, Lake Mead would already be in a tier two shortage. So we know that these things work. Again, this isn't rocket science, it's not brain surgery. More water in the lake is what helps us control our destiny. So what is the drought contingency plan? Um, once finalized, the drought contingency plan hopes to protect Lake Mead from falling below elevation 1020. It implements additional voluntary reductions in water use above and beyond what are in the 07 guidelines. Um, it includes commitments that the US will work to create and conserve Colorado River water as well as the states. Um, and under certain conditions, reduction, the volumes that are contributed to the reservoir um, can be recovered. And it does a lot of this to incentivize people to store water in the lake. Um, as we sit here today, California has no requirement to add any water to the lake until Arizona CAP project of 1.2 million acre feet is dry. Um, so we have to come up with ways to address the problem proactively. We need to give people the flexibility to access that water, not just have it taken away. So I'm gonna pause here for a second and say this is not a renegotiation. And we've heard that a lot, that we're renegotiating the guidelines. That's not the way I view it. I don't think that's anyone, the way anyone in the negotiating room views it. This is viewed as a Band-Aid. It's meant to be set on top of the current guidelines to, cur to help curtail the risk we have and allow the negotiations to go on that are required to begin no later than 2020. Um, if this is what we come out with at the end of the guidelines, I think everyone's going to be disappointed. <laughs> um, and that was not the intent. It was really to take the framework we had and to stop the bleeding if the hydrology that we're given um, continues to be hot and dry. So here's a table of voluntary reductions. What's on the furthest left two columns is Arizona and Nevada's reduction under the current guidelines. I will remind you that Nevada has a paltry 1.8% of the flow of the Colorado River allocated to it. Um, so that's why our numbers are significantly less than our friends in Arizona, not because we negotiated a better deal, just because we have a lot less water than them. Um, 
the next column over are the voluntary reductions. And there's two things noteworthy here. One is that you can see Arizona and Nevada have to make sacrifices a lot sooner. We've, we're already below some of these elevations. And yes, Arizona is conserving an amount equivalent to this now, but it's being done in a compensated fashion. And I don't think the state of Arizona, just like the upper basin, has a plan for how they could continue to compensate people um, to not use water when these reductions are in place. Um, under a shortage, it's mandatory. So it goes away, there is no compensation. But under a voluntary framework like this, that's a very difficult issue to deal with. The other thing that's noteworthy is California's participation. California comes in for the first time and they come in really low in the reservoir. But if you look over to the left, California is coming in when CAP has lost about half of their water instead of their entire ditch. Um, and they're contributing a significant amount of water and that significant amount of water comes with trade-offs um, for them being able to access some of the water that they store if there's an emergency in California. The combined total reductions that are listed in the very far column show that if we go below 1025, the, the reduced use in the lower basin will exceed 1.1 million acre feet. Um, this balances the reservoir at the low end. It doesn't do a lot to push the reservoir higher. And again, that's because this wasn't a renegotiation. This was to stop the current bleeding. So how does this relate to um, our elevations? And I put Lake, Powell, uh, Lake Mead first in these sets of charts. The dark line on the top of each of these is the risk of Lake Mead going below 1,000 in any month um, from now through 2026 when the guidelines are set to expire. You can see if we look at the stress test hydrology, that's a hydrology that has a more representative mean compared to what we've seen in recent years than the full hydrology. There's that 35% I talked about probability of us going below 1,000. What you see in the, the thicker dashed line is how that probability changes if the lower basin um, and by national components, so that's Mexico's components of the DCP are factored in. And there's a significant reduction in our risk. Then what you see in the dotted lines below those are what happens if the upper basin plan comes on. And what we see there, like we'll see on the next slide as well, is that the upper basin's plan helps the lower basin and the lower basin plan helps the upper basin. That's not to say that there are times when one basin's plan for one year may have a negative impact on the other basin. That happens, but on the long term, when you look at the picture through 2026, both plans help the other basin out. And this is um, now the Lake Powell chart. It's looking at elevation 3490, which again is the minimum power pool in Lake Powell. The dark line being nothing happening. The dashed line, the thicker dashed line, being what happens when just the lower basin plan is implemented on Lake Powell. And you see that that does provide an improvement to Lake Powell, even without the upper basin's own plan. Um, and then what's layered on in the dotted lines are the upper basin's plan and the impacts that those have on Lake Powell. And again, I'm gonna switch back and forth. Our world looks a lot better with DCPs than it does without. So I'm going to stop there, and I'll take any questions you guys might have. Thank you, Colby. Um, so when Lake Mead gets to 35, no, I'm sorry, when Lake Powell gets to 35, 25, and Lake Mead gets to 1020. What happens to water quality? Have you done any studies on that? Well, that depends on which water user you're talking about. Um, as far as Southern Nevada goes, um, as we get warmer water, um, we get more organics, um, and we're required to use more chemicals. 
um, that's for our treatment supply. Uh, do we see foresee us having to make huge investments in different water quality technology? No, not in, unless there's significant regulatory changes that go along with it. However, the river's water quality may change substantially. Um, you'll see the warming of Lake Mead to levels that you haven't seen yet. Um, we've already seen Lake Powell warming. Um, we know that that has a significant impact on the humpback chub, for example, have been doing better under these warmer releases from Lake Powell. We also know really nasty things like sunfish and crawfish do better in warm water. Um, and there's another thing that does really well in warm water, and that's some of the nasty blue-green algae that um, creates cyanobacteria and other toxins um, that, are, that are problematic for both the ecosystem and for drinking water. Hi there. Um, I was wondering if you have any idea what the possible impact of the upper basin delaying signing its own DCP might be on the lower basin's willingness to uh, finish their DCP by the end of the calendar year. <laughs> Maybe that's a tricky one. No, I, I don't think it's tricky um, as much as it is speculative. I think that the lower basin has to do their plan. Um, I, I think we are very aggressive about the timeline we've set forward. I would also say that we're very optimistic that all of the problems are going to be resolved in that time. Um, I don't think that the two plans, um, there are assurances that each basin is looking for in the other basin implementing their plan. Um, and there's legislation, as I agree with Eric, there is legislation that is needed for the lower basin plan. Um, and that's really the upper basin's decision that they want to be in sync with the lower basin because of the legislation and all of those opportunities. I, d I don't know that I could say that the lower basin would stop um, if the upper basin backed away. Um, but I think it makes sense for both basins to try and work together towards a common deadline. Earlier we heard a discussion about uh, financial challenges for Colorado and water issues. You mentioned uh, the hefty sum of $1.4 billion that's been spent in uh, Southern Nevada. How, how have you financed that? It has all been, uh, how is it financed? Yeah, is municipal, it bonds. Payers, yeah. municipal bonds. Um, we paid for all of it with municipal bonds, um, and we added two different charges to our customers to cover um, the cost of those bonds. We go through a public process called, um, it's called a couple different things, but we, um, what we've found the most successful is we convene a cross section of the community into what we call an integrated resource planning and advisory committee. That committee includes people from our largest industries, resorts, um, hotel gaming, and the associated um, industries. It includes banks. Um, it includes environmental interests. And we walk them through what we see happening in the community and where we need the community to go. Um, and they make a recommendation to our board after they slog through months of information. Um, and their recommendation was to cover this through both fixed charges and variable charges to the customer. Um, and those charges will be used over the next 20 years to pay off all of the municipal bonds that were used to pay for the project. The, uh, the growth and development in the Las Vegas community has just been phenomenal. Are there ever any conversations in your community about somehow regulating the arrival of new water consumers? <laughs> as, as the status quo would appear to be uh, unsustainable. Well, what's, what's interesting, and I'll talk about this from two angles, is the legal framework in which SNWA and the Water District operates, we don't get to make growth decisions. Um, our county planning committees and our city planning committees are the, and city councils are the ones that make decisions whether or not to um, allow the community to grow. 
what we're asked to do is show the community how it can continue to grow. Um, I didn't put resource plan slides up here, but what we've messaged to our community and what's shown in our resource plan is yes, this community can continue to grow, but it has to be a lot more serious about conservation than it is today. If you live in the Las Vegas Valley, where there's less than four inches of natural rainfall a year, and you have a median that is covered in turf, and the only person walking on it is the man pushing the lawnmower, that is a luxury our community cannot afford if we want to continue to have the economy that we have today. Um, and we can show under many growth and conservation planning scenarios that we can make that happen successfully. But conservation is our first, second, and third resource for making that happen. The other thing that I'll say is the issue is not specific to Las Vegas. If Las Vegas were to stop growth today, people would still be migrating out of California and in from the East Coast and growth would continue within the West and within the Colorado River Basin. And that's because of weather, 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 and because of jobs and job growth. So one city doing it isn't enough to prevent um, what's eventually going to happen in the West. They may stop coming to Las Vegas, they'll go to Phoenix. If you stop it in Phoenix and Tucson, they'll go elsewhere. They'll go to the Inland Empire in California. But people are moving West, people are moving out of California, and that's going to continue to happen. Toby, I'll ask maybe the last question. Federal legislation, who's asking for it? Who needs it in the lower basin? And what will that, what does that federal legislation need to address? I said, if you, if you can repeat my question. <laughs> the, the question was um, federal legislation, what is it needed for? Who needs it? And, and what does it need to address? Um, the, there are a series of, as I said, carrots and sticks within the lower basin DCP, and some of those are access to water, um, water stored on a temporary basis Why we're in shortage. And that is something that for the plan to work for all of the folks participating in, we need. Um, so it's a lower basin need, um, and it's a, it's a federal, it's something the federal government has to do as the water master within the lower basin. Thank you.